Friday. Yeah. And we love Friday. Sit pro. Because we get to do civil procedure on Friday. And you get to listen to me talk at you about the wonders of civil litigation for an entire hour and 15 minutes, sometimes an hour and a half, sometimes two hours. What? But not today. Today, you're going to work. Who has drafted motions before? Yeah, almost all of you. You feel pretty confident that you know how to do it? This is, this is a good test for Dunning-Kruger, right? Yes, I definitely can do it. Okay, well, we'll see. We'll see. So here's where we are in the timeline of this fictitious Hatfield versus McCoy case that we've been doing thus far this semester. You filed your complaint, which we drafted right here in class. That was a miracle. And then you served the complaint, right? Today I'm going to ask you to put on the defendant's hat. You've just been served with this complaint. And you want to ask the court for something. Now there is an action that has been filed in the court and it's got a real case number and a real judge assigned to it. And this is real, you have to defend the action. It's not real, it's made up in class, but you know what I'm saying. You wanna ask the court for something, and so, as many of you hopefully already know, you have to make a motion to do that. Well, how do you go about doing that? Obviously it depends on the court that you're in. But what rules are you going to rely on? For the federal rules, 7B, a little bit of Rule 10, and Rule 11, okay? And that's about all you get. <coughs> that's about all you get. Where do you think you might go in the Kentucky rules. Seven point oh two is a good place, right? Rule seven's good. Seven point oh two is the counterpart to Rule seven B, right? Or CR eleven. That's good too. Okay. But don't forget the local rules because this is frustratingly different every place you go. Okay. Every place wants different things from. Usually there are different rules for dispositive motions, right? And we'll get into that. We're not talking about motions for summary judgment. We're not talking about motions to dismiss. We're not talking about motions to get rid of the case in general, for the most part. Leave that off the plate for today. We'll get there. But just as an example of how frustratingly different these things can be, has anybody attended, who in here has attended a motion hour in a Kentucky court, a few of you. Yeah, okay, good, almost all of them, that's great. So you understand basically how the process works. In the Jefferson Circuit Court, you have a motion for summary judgment. You just file it with the judge, you don't notice it. You don't show up for motion hour, you don't need to do that. You file it, you wait for the response, then if you wanna have a hearing, maybe you ask for a hearing. You usually just wait. <coughs> there's a thing called, there's a form called an AOC 280 that you can file that some judges like and some judges get a little cranky about. So again, know that judge. But it says, hey, we're ready for you to make a decision on this. Other than that, you just file and you wait. But you go out in the counties, Grayson County, Pulaski County, counties that aren't Jefferson County or Fayette County, because right? those exist, you know that. And you, file, you have to file your motion for summary judgment at the motion hour. Here, if you do something like that, show up at the motion hour um, and you ask for a hearing and then they give you a hearing if you need a hearing on something like a dispositive motion they might give you a hearing six months in the future out in the counties where the dockets are smaller many local practitioners have been surprised by this you file your motion for summary judgment you notice it you figured out that you had to have to notice it in this other county Notice it for the motion hour, and you show up for the motion hour, and you argue it right then. Okay? They don't give you a hearing date sometime in the future. You don't get that time to prepare. You just show up and argue. So you got to consult the local rules to know how this is. Anybody totally lost has no idea what I'm talking about at all? Good. All right. And if you, if you are totally lost, you're not telling me. So that's good. Good, po good poker faces. Um, 
but this stuff isn't hard, right? It, it, and, and what makes it what makes it difficult is that you expect it to be more difficult than it is, right? And so I have young lawyers asking me all the time, "Can I file a motion for this or that thing? Like, what if I want to do this? Can I file a motion for that? What's what kind of motions can I file?" And the answer usually is the kind of motion that you can file is limited only by your imagination. Right? The only reason I gave you the examples that I gave you on the blackboard, which everybody was able to access those, okay, yes, okay, very good. Um, the only reason I gave you those is to illustrate there's all kinds of different things that you can ask for with these, right? So if you think of something you want to ask the court for, can you write it up in a motion? Sure you can. Here's the state court example, notice motion order. I just want to file a supplement to this brief that we filed before. Sure, why not, okay? Tender the order there. And the federal court, motion to compel production of IRS transcripts. Right? I want the court to order the government to turn over this stuff. I explained why very briefly. I have my certificate of service. No tendered order because you don't do that in the federal court. Right? My favorite is, this isn't exactly a motion, I guess. Have you guys seen this? This is my, this is my favorite of all time. Yeah. yeah, I know. People in my class have already seen it. It's, it's styled a notice, but really it's a motion to F this court and everything that it stands for. Which the uh, Washington Post describes as the legal document American needs. Yeah. Pro se stuff is the best. Okay, so pretty much anything you can think of, put it into a motion, follow the rules, especially the local rules, and then draw it up. Okay? Can you do it? You can. And you will, right? Put your defense hat on. You represent the defendant. His name is James Hatfield. The plaintiff is Leonard McCoy. Your objection, Circuit Court, Division Two. You've been served with the complaint. You're going to answer it somehow. Maybe you're going to file a motion to dismiss. Maybe you're just going to answer. Maybe you're going to file a motion to strike. Maybe you're going to do something else. Maybe you're going to file a motion for summary judgment instead of answering. Can you do that? Can you file a motion for summary judgment as the defendant right off the bat? Like that? Without even answering? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. We'll get there. But right now, you need more time to figure it out. You figure out what it is you're going to do. Okay. 20 days from the date of service is just not going to cut it for you. So you want to ask the court for more time. Okay. Draft me up a motion that you could really file in the Jefferson Circuit Court. Okay. That's what we're doing today. Feel good about this? Yeah. Yeah? You can get out of here so early. Oh, you can do this in like 15 minutes, right? This is easy. I've given you everything you need. But if you need more, if you don't have this stuff in your motion, you have a problem. Okay? Talking about state court motions. The heading and the title, including your case number, because if you file something in any court without the case number, electronic filing makes this a little bit more forgiving. But for most of my career, if you file something without a case number, it would just disappear into a black hole and never be seen again. Okay. Have to have the case number. Who's involved? Refer to Rule 7. A notice of when the motion will be heard. I'll let you figure that one out. But that part, you don't do this one in the federal court, OK? There's no notice requirement in the federal court because you just file electronically and you wait for the judge to do whatever they're going to do. An explanation of what you want and why, that should be obvious. A jurisdictional statement with just about anything that you file in a court 
needs to have some, needs to reassure the court that, and I'll probably say this 50 times this semester, but anything that you file with the court needs to reassure the court that they have the authority to do, this isn't even mine, that they have the authority to do what you're asking them to do, okay? Always when you file something with the court. You guys okay over here? Questions? Signature block, as per Rule 11, certificate of service. What's a certificate of service? What does a certificate of service say? What's the function of a certificate of service? Yes? And just to say that I delivered the signature or they have a copy of the book or it's a... <coughs> I gave it to somebody, usually the other side, right? Certificate of service says, I gave this motion to the other side, therefore this is not impermissible ex parte contact. We're a good shape here, right? And then a tendered order again, just in the state court. Okay. Are we in Western District? What? Western District? No, we are in the Jefferson Circuit Court. I'll go back. Jefferson Circuit Court, Division Two. Division Two. Okay, so I'm going to share the same document we did the. Uh, Point Ready? Work in pairs. Go. When you are, when you, when you think you've got it, throw your hand up, and I'll come look at it where you are. Okay. I see. Oh, no matter how you're right. Tender to work. This here. Tender.